Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the V2. I think we did the V1 and the V3, and people were like, Simon, where's the V2 at? You've just skipped the V2. Where's the V2? Here it is. Calm down. Just before we get into today's episode, I will say that it's brought to you by what? It's brought to you by Beard Blaze. What is Beard Blaze? Some of you might have heard this before, but I've got another channel called Business Blaze. And that actually led to the development of this very majestic product right here. Long story short, as I made a joke about how YouTubers have beauty lines, and a fan of that channel emailed me saying, like, Simon, don't have a beauty line. That's not your thing, old chap. But what you can do is beard oil. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. Beard Blaze makes a full, luscious beard a reality. Look at this thing. Solving all of life's problems with fine facial hair, not a guarantee. Life's problems, that is. Your beard will be awesome. The story was the guy I teamed up with on this, Will, sent me a bunch of samples. I rubbed them into my beard and I chose the best ones and then we released them as a range of beard oils. If you're not sure which one's for you, we also do samples because someone watched the videos like, Simon, how do I know which one to get? And I was like, Will, can we make a sample pack? And Will was like, hell yes. How cool is this? So how is this different from other beard oils? Basically, I've used a lot of beard oils. I think this is just better, personally. Works great with my beard. Also, what we didn't do is make it in these tiny little bottles that cost a fortune. This is a large bottle you can see here. I have regular sized man sized hands. And uh, this is a decent sized bottle that will last you a good long while. There's no special code. There's no special anything. This is something that I get to control. So it's just at a good price. Go to beardblaze.com. That's that. Let's get into it. Almost three months to the day that the largest invasion fleet in history appeared off the coast of Normandy, Hitler ordered the use of a weapon that would go on to define the 20th century. Though this weapon could do little to aid the crumbling German forces, it proved to be an enormous step forward in modern warfare and eventually space travel. So thank you, Hitler. Just joking. Hashtag cancel Simon. Simon Whistler taken out of context. On the morning of the 7th of September 1944, the first two V2 rockets were fired at Paris. Both fell short, causing no damage. But in the coming months, many certainly hit their targets. In total, 3,172 rockets were fired at targets across Belgium, the UK, Holland, France, and in an act of blind, last-ditch desperation, even Germany itself as the Nazis tried to block the Allies crossing the Rhine. These were countries that had already borne the brunt of the German Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe in the preceding years, but this was an entirely new terror. Like its younger brother, the V1, the V2 failed to break the spirit of the Allied civilians. It was a dastardly weapon, but thankfully one that came too late in the day to be of any use to Adolf Hitler. But the V2 rocket was just the start of the frantic missile race that began shortly after the conclusion of World War II. Much has been said about Hitler's retribution weapons and why they were used when they were, especially on this channel, we have covered them. The V1, V2, and V3 all fell into this category, and luckily for any interested viewers, we've already done videos on the V1 and the V3, as I said, so if you're having a Nazi experimental weapon kind of day, well, look no further than Mega Projects for more glorious content. And also Beard Oil at BeardBlaze.com. These were all weapons that appeared shortly after D-Day, a fact that leads many to assume that they were simply vicious weapons used by a dictator amid the final throes of his rule, which is only partly actually correct. The truth is, for all his bloodthirsty tendencies, and boy did he have those, Hitler was highly dubious about these experimental weapons. Probably for good reason. These weapons were all technologically sound, more or less, but were very much rushed in their final phases of development. These were not quite the finished articles, and while they were able to add a new layer of horror to an already horrendous war, Hitler only ordered their use once it became clear that his Western Front was on the verge of collapse. The V2 would always be associated with one man, and it isn't Adolf Hitler. Werner von Braun, a German aerospace engineer, was very much a man who experienced two lives. Born in Germany two years before the outbreak of World War I, von Braun eventually became involved with rocketry in the 1930s and proved himself every bit equal to his mentor and idol Hermann Julius Oberth, widely considered one of the founding fathers of rocketry. In 1933, while von Braun was working on his doctorate at the Technical University of Berlin, the Nazi party assumed control and, well, I think we all know where the story goes from there. Von Braun played a pivotal role in the development of the V2 rocket, but 
As I said, he's a man with two lives. After the defeat of Nazi Germany, the brilliant von Braun was whisked thousands of miles away from his homeland and was eventually granted US citizenship. His work for NASA, particularly on the development of the Saturn V rocket that took the Apollo missions to the moon, was absolutely groundbreaking. He went from Nazi party member to American hero within the span of 30 years. Anyway, I'm getting way too ahead of myself, but it is important to highlight the progression of Von Braun's work. On the surface of things, and if you don't know much about this topic, you might think, well, <laughs> what does a Nazi superweapon and the Apollo program have in common? But they had a lot in common. German leaders understood the importance of Von Braun's early work. His thesis, Construction Theoretical and Experimental Solution to the Problem of Liquid Propellant Rockets, was written in 1934, and it wasn't declassified by Germany until 1960. This was the kind of theoretical brilliance, and Von Braun was the kind of ingenious person that the Nazi party knew they had to keep close to their chest. Shortly after its release, Von Braun secured an Ordnance Department research grant and began building and testing rockets. And so the Aggregate Rocket series was born. The first rocket, known as A-1, is generally seen as the grandfather of most modern rockets. At just 1.4 meters in height, 30.4 centimeters in diameter, and with a takeoff weight of only 150 kilograms, it wasn't exactly the fearsome beast that we have come to associate with the word rocket. It was also wildly unstable and quickly led to a new design. By December 1934, he and his team had successfully launched two A2 rockets, one reaching a height of 2.2 kilometers and the other 3.5 kilometers. In terms of physical appearance, it looked almost identical to the A1, but came with a separate propellant tank. The tests in front of high-ranking officials cemented Von Braun's position and reputation, and he was actively encouraged to press on. During the summer of 1936, with Nazi Germany basking in the glow of the Berlin Summer Olympics, Von Braun's team were thinking big, and designs began to take on a wholly more militaristic feel. Design specifications from the German military called for a one-ton payload, a range of 276 kilometers, and a dispersion of between 3.2 kilometers and 4.8 kilometers. That's a lot to ask, considering what they were doing a few years before. In early December 1937, during Operation Lighthouse, a series of A3 launches took place at Kummersdorf, a launch site south of Berlin. They were all unmitigated disasters. All four tests failed to reach their desired altitude and followed the same rough pattern of premature engine cut out and a fiery wreckage not far from the takeoff point. And this was back before they had Photoshop. Do you remember a few years ago that, I can't remember who it was, but a country faked, maybe it was North Korea, faked their missile succeeding and people were like, yo, that's just a Photoshop of the other one, guys. It was a sobering experience for Von Braun and the development of the V4 was immediately put on hold as they tried to determine why all of the tests had gone so wrong. Now, if you're expecting the A4 at this point, well, hold your horses. While the A4 would eventually go on to become the V2, Von Braun decided to test various factors on the slightly smaller version, the A5. The A5 rocket was 5.8 meters long with a diameter of 0.78 meters. It had a takeoff weight of 900 kilograms and came with a new control system built by Siemens. Tests on the A5 were much more promising, and over the course of around 80 flights up until 1943, the rockets reached a maximum height of roughly 12 kilometers and a range of 17.7 kilometers. Perhaps most importantly, however, they greatly contributed to the team's understanding of rocket aerodynamics, as well as allowing them to test the more advanced guidance system. And with that, well, the pieces were really starting to fall into place. Through a mixture of trial and error and sheer mechanical wizardry, Von Braun and his team were now approaching a high-altitude rocket with fearsome capabilities. The A4, as it was first known, took flight for the first time in March 1942, but only clocked up a paltry distance of 1.6 kilometers. However, things improved at a dramatic pace. The third launch in October of 1942 was hailed as a great success and followed its projected trajectory perfectly, landing 193 kilometers away after reaching an altitude of 83 kilometers. In December 1942, Hitler ordered the A4 into mass production. Production. This may have been a little hasty, as there were still countless issues to address, but Adolf was never a man of restraints and patience. We definitely know that. Through 1943, production was stepped up at three separate facilities, each using slave labor, because of course they were, either from captured prisoners of war or the civilian population. But it was the civilian population that proved to be a real thorn in the side. One of the V2 test sites was near Blizner in central Poland. The Polish resistance began taking note of the strange rockets flying into the sky, and when one V2 fell almost intact into marshland, it was carefully concealed from the Germans before being painstakingly taken apart and moved to Warsaw for further analysis. And here we have one of those wonderfully audacious missions of World War II. The Poles contacted British intelligence 
engines and a bold plan was conceived. On the 25th of July 1944, a British transportation aircraft took off from Italy and landed at an abandoned airfield at Matsin near Lublin, an area surrounded by Germans hastily pulling back from the advancing Soviet tide coming from the east. Out of the woods came the Polish resistance, dragging carts piled high with parts from the captured V2, which were quickly loaded into the waiting plane. In almost a cinematic, nerve-shredding moment, the plane's wheels sank into the ground, preventing it from taking off. The Poles dug frantically with their bare hands to provide enough traction for the plane to begin taxiing. This should be a movie if it's not already. If it's a movie, let me know. Two days later, after a series of journeys, the aircraft landed in Britain and scientists and engineers began examining this new superweapon. How is this not a movie? <laughs> The V2 was 14 meters in length, quite an upgrade from the 1 meter tall A1 all those years ago. It was also 1.65 meters in diameter and had a wingspan of 3.56 meters. The rocket weighed 12,500 kilograms, which, this is Mega Project's silly weight analogy, that's twice as heavy as a male adult elephant. The warhead contained amatol, which weighed 1,000 kilograms. The rocket used a mixture of ethanol and water for its propellant, 75% ethanol, 25% water, weighing a total of 3,810 kilograms. This was one of the hindrances that the Germans faced during mass production, as the amount of ethanol available was dependent on the local potato harvest, which, as you might imagine, during the war was fairly up and down. After launching, the V2 would travel for roughly 65 seconds, reaching a height of 80 kilometers before the engine shut down and it fell back to Earth on a ballistic free-for-all trajectory. The rocket was guided by four external rudders on the tail fins and four internal graphite vanes in the jet stream, all controlled by an analog computer called the Mishkarat. This information was sent via electrical hydraulic servo motors based on electrical signals from the gyros. Two gyroscopes were used, one for the horizontal pitch and one for the vertical yaw and roll. Also included was the PIGA accelerometer, which measured speed and distance covered which dictated when the engine cut off, depending on where the target was. Production of the V-2 was badly hampered by a massive Allied airstrike, codenamed Operation Hydra, which targeted the German Scientific Research Center at Pinemunde. <laughs> Pinemunde, maybe? Of course, this wasn't by chance. The Allies had been tipped off by an Austrian resistance group regarding what was being developed at Pinemunde. Over the course of one night straddling the 17th and 18th of August 1943, RAF bombers laid waste to the area across three separate waves. The death toll for everybody involved was incredibly high. The RAF lost 40 bombers and 215 crewmen, while scores of civilians and prisoners of war on the ground were also killed. It's thought that Operation Hydra put back the emergence of the V-2 by four to six weeks, which in the long run must have saved many lives, but was far from the total obliteration that the British had hoped for. The Germans rather ingeniously camouflaged the ground to make it appear like the destruction had been more severe than it actually had been. The site was left alone for the rest of the war, but production and testing quickly began again. Including Operation Hydra and the horrific conditions many worked in during the production of the rockets, historians believe roughly 20,000 people died while building this Nazi wonder weapon. The Germans had initially envisioned stationary launch sites close to the English Channel, but this was changed in favor of mobile launch pads. In July 1944, with the Allies quickly establishing a foothold in Normandy, four separate storage dumps for the weapons had been built in northern France. As they prepared to begin operations, the Germans estimated 350 launches per week, with 100 per day a maximum output, although this was never seen as sustainable. The first rockets were launched against Paris on the 7th of September 1944, with the first hit the French capital coming the following day. London was also hit for the first time on the 8th of September, with a V2 claiming its first British lives. This included a three-year-old child. Now remember that the Allies knew full well what was coming. The information on the V2s that had been smuggled out of continental Europe painted a pretty definitive picture. With this in mind, the British government's reluctance to announce the use of the new Nazi weapon probably had more to do with not wanting to cause mass panic. They even went so far as to blame the explosions on faulty gas lines. By mid-November, however, any denial seemed ludicrous. I mean, <laughs> how long are you going to get? Yeah, it was another gas line. <laughs> We're definitely not at war. What are you talking about? Our Prime Minister Winston Churchill announced to the nation that the Germans had been using a new type of a rocket weapon. Antwerp took the brunt of the V2 attacks, with 1,736 killed and 4,500 injured in the Greater Antwerp area. This was primarily because of the city's port, which remained intact and open, unlike every other port strung across northern Europe. The Allies were struggling to get resupplies through the beaches of Normandy, and this corner of Belgium was seen as vital and 
Well, Hitler sure knew it. The death toll in London was higher, 2,754 civilians killed and another 6,523 injured, despite receiving slightly less V2 attacks down to the dense population in the English capital. The British began sending fake messages through turned spies and double agents, saying the V2s were overshooting their target and the Germans duly obliged. Almost half of the rockets fired at London fell short, and because of that, the counter-espionage operation known as Operation Double Cross was remarkably effective. The final V2 and the last to claim British life came on the 27th of March 1945 when a rocket landed on Orpington in Kent. With the Allied advance now thundering across Europe, the V2s pulled back out of range. The V weapon certainly caused damage, but their psychological impact was far greater than the damage. These were weapons that had never been seen, and for many, perhaps never even considered. Just think that 30 years before, pilots had to drop a bomb out of a rickety aircraft. The progress that had been made was absolutely extraordinary. People just couldn't believe it. But these were costly weapons. The V1 and V2 programs cost roughly $40 billion when adjusted for inflation. That's double what the US spent to build the atomic bomb. A total of 6,048 V2s were built at a reported cost of 100,000 Reichsmarks each. That was about $249,000, which equates to a pricey $3.7 million today, but only about half of them were ever launched. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main problems came down to potatoes. A single V2 required roughly 30 tons of the vegetable to make the alcohol needed for the propellant, with the nation being bombed into the the previous century by the Allies, food was scarce, and this was a major reason why so few V2s were launched. The V2s acted as a sort of final hurrah to Hitler's murderous ambitions. They exemplified just how far ahead German scientists were at the time, but they had little to no impact on the war. If anything, considering the huge resources put into Hitler's vengeance weapons, they may have been more of a hindrance to the preservation of the Third Reich. But the V2s certainly had a profound impact on what came next. With the Nazis defeated, the Allies took their pick of German scientists and engineers. Werner von Braun made his way to the US, along with around 1,600 of Germany's best and brightest. The blueprints of the V2 fell into the hands of both the Soviets and the European Allies, and the race for the intercontinental missile soon began. So look, if you can look past the murderous intent that it was created for, the V2 was a hugely important step forward. The years of work done by von Braun in the lead up to World War II undoubtedly sped up the space race, going from mass murder to one small step for man in just 25 years. That's insane. The scientific and engineering line between murderous carnage and groundbreaking developments can sometimes be a fine one. And so it proved to be with the V2, the revenge weapon. That eventually led us to space. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, be sure to smash that like button. Also, why don't you get some smashing beard oil if you are a man with a beard? Just go to beardblaze.com and you will find all sorts of fantastic beard oils there. And as always, thank you for watching.